of a living organism of a living organism what this means is that uh, within a cell we have different organelles which do different uh, types of work so, so to enable a living organism to continue with its growth its growth and development life for instance we have mitochondrial which is uh, responsible for respiration we also have the chloroplasts in the plants which are responsible for the manufacturing of, uh, of food and uh, so forth so in our in our topic today we just want to look at the physiological processes that occur within the cell and how they are brought on book so basically the first thing you have to do here is to define what cell physiology is now we are going to define cell physiology and we are saying cell physiology we are defining cell physiology this is cell physiology this is this is the study this is the study this is the study of this is the study of the functions of different of different parts of a cell of different parts of a cell what we are talking about is that uh, we have different we have different parts of a cell as i have mentioned we have mitochondrial we have endoplasmic reticulum we have the chloroplast so how do those combine so that we have full functioning of this cell within a living organism that is what what is important today so this is the definition of the cell of uh, the term cell physiology we are only interested in the looking how the the cell functions within a living organism so basically that is what we are interested in having looked at that there is a specific uh, structure within a cell that enables all these functions that we are talking about to occur and that is what we refer to as a cell membrane so we want to look at uh, the structure of a cell membrane so that we relate it to its specific functions in the movement of uh, particles or uh, molecules within and outside the the cell so first of all let us just draw an illustrative image of a cell we can just draw it down here of an a uh, simple uh, animal cell as observed under a light microscope of course when you are observing uh, cells or uh, let us say objects or uh, molecules under a light microscope we are saying it does not have clear resolution so under light microscope we are assuming this is the cell this one is what we refer to as the cell membrane this is the cell membrane in within here where a lot of content is submerged here this is what we refer to as the cytoplasm between here is the powerhouse of the cell this is what we refer to as the nucleus that is where the cell powerhouse is located now this is what we want to look at today as far as cell physiology is concerned so we want to narrow down to look at the cell membrane we are going to look at the structure and how it functions in the regulation of molecules in and out of the cell now the first thing we have to look is the is the composition or what we refer to as anatomy of the cell membrane which makes it able to perform all those things that we are going to look at so the first thing is what we are referring to as let us just look at the structure of the cell membrane structure of cell membrane why is it 
that it is possible for this cell membrane to allow uh, particles to come inside and leave the cell at the same time. So the first thing you have to notice is that uh, the cell membrane is thin. We are just looking at its adaptation. It is thin. Why is it thin? To allow permeability, to, to allow permeability of certain molecules inside the cell. The other thing you need to know about uh, the cell membrane is that it is made up of it is made it is made up of a by layer by layer or what we refer to as a phospho phospholipid layer phospholipid layer so these two are basically the major things that enable the cell membrane to carry out the physiological processes that we are just about to see. So the first one is that it is thin enough to allow, to allow easy movement of particles in and outside the cell. We are also saying that uh, it is made up of a double layer of phospholipid or of, uh, of uh, lipid and uh, proteins. So we are saying that that double layer, we are going to look at how it regulates the movement of particles inside and outside uh, the cell. Now basically, these are the things that you need to outline as far as the structure of a cell membrane is concerned. So let us just look at the structure itself so that now we understand on what we are talking about. So we'll just draw an illustrative structure here so that we understand basically what we are talking about. So this one is, uh, we just want to draw an illustrative structure like this. It is not a complex thing. It is something that you can draw at your comfort. So basically, we are not going to draw a lot of things because it is just an illustration so that we can understand basically what we are talking about. So this is the structure. This is the structure of a cell membrane. This one is enough for, for our illustration. Now you need to understand that uh, either within or above these two layers here, which I'm going to name them, we have what we call the protein layer, this one. Protein layer. In between here, the two, this is what now we refer to as phospholipid layer. Here, this one is also the protein layer. This is the protein layer. Here, we have what we call the pores. Of course, the pores, this one here, is the one that allows the movement of substances inside and outside the cell. This is just a hole. A pore is just a hole. So we have protein layer here. We have phospholipid layer here. And we also have protein layer above here. We, you can also find that these protein layers are embedded within the phospholipid layer. And the major function of these layers that we are mentioning is to ensure is to ensure that maybe the proteins or the lipids do not enter to the sites that they are not required. So that is the major functions of the protein layer and the phospholipid layer. The lipid layer, of course, that is the fatty layer of the, of the cell membrane, and we have the protein layer. It ensures that maybe the lipids or the protein layers are not going to the sites that they are not required. So this is the structure of a cell membrane which enables it to perform the physiological processes that we are just about to look at. Now, having looked at that, we have the main functions of the cell membrane. You can go to an exam and you are asked uh, to explain the main, we are talking about the main functions of the cell membrane. 
So even as we continue to articulate these issues, you can continue sending in your questions through the number that is passing below your screens. And also, you can engage us on uh, Facebook, KUTV, Elim Live, so that we can continue to answer your questions as we continue to, to outline uh, this lesson as far as the cell physiology is concerned. Now, we want to look at the main functions of the cell membrane. We are talking about main functions of cell membrane. We are talking at about main function of the cell membrane. And the function number one of a cell membrane is that it regulates, we are talking about regulation. It regulates, it, regu it regulates the movement, it regulates the movement of materials inside and outside the cell. Now, when we are talking about regulation, we are saying that we have other particles that are allowed to come inside the cell, but we also have other larger particles that are not allowed to come inside the cell. So because of that, we need a membrane that is going to siphon those particles that we do not want so that we remain with what we want within the cell. So that is the function of a cell membrane. It allows only what we require to come within the cell. Another function of the cell membrane, number two, it is separation or it separates It separates, we are talking about it separates the content. It separates the content of, of the cell with that of the surrounding, with that of the surrounding medium, with that of the surrounding Media. Now, when you are talking about re separation, assuming, now let's just go back to our illustration here, or I can just draw another simple illustration somewhere around here so that we can understand better what you are talking about. Now, assuming this is a plant cell, assuming this is a plant cell, this is just an assumption. And uh, we have here a mitochondrion. At this place here, let us put it here. We have the chloroplast. So this one is a mitochondrion. Mitochondrion. At this region here, we have the chloroplast. Now, we are saying that uh, the function of the cell is to separate the content of, uh, of a cell from the other one. Now, I want you to remember that each organelle that I've mentioned here has its own cell membrane. Now, within the mitochondrion, we all know that uh, respiration takes place within mitochondrion. Now, Inside the chloroplast, we have said we are assuming this is a plant cell. Inside the chloroplast, we have photosynthesis taking place. Now, during photosynthesis, we are saying that there is a release in oxygen. While during mitochondrion, uh, during, sorry, the respiration, the mitochondrion uses the same oxygen to respire or to create the energy. Now, you see, these are two organelles that are 
a meeting different things at the same time. Now, because those different things are used at different times, for instance, now we are talking about uh, photosynthesis which occurs during uh, uh, daytime, when there is a, the, during the presence of light, we are saying that when oxygen now is being released, when oxygen is being released during respiration, this oxygen is going to be used by the same plant for this oxygen is going to be used by the same same plant because it is being released by the chloroplast during photosynthesis. It is going to be used by the same same plant in respiration. So this content cannot mix at that particular time because we have what we are referring to as the cell membrane. We have the chloroplast which has the membrane and we also have a mitochondrion which has the membrane. Also, the content within this cell cannot mix because what the chloroplast can take in is not what the mitochondrion can take in. That one we need to know. So there is a separation because we have a liquid here within the cytoplasm. So there is a separation between these two organelles so that there is no mixing of the content within that particular uh, organelle, uh, organ uh, cell as far as organelles are concerned. Now, those are specific uh, functions that uh, the cell uh, carries out. One, regulation of the movement of materials inside and outside the cell. And we are saying that the second one is the separation of the contents that are within the, the contents that are within, within the cell and the surrounding. So specifically, that is what it happens. And I've told you each of these organelles have their membrane. So we, let us continue with, under, with the asking the questions with the, uh, through the number that is passing on the screen so that we can answer them as we continue with our lessons. So having looked at that, the functions of the cell membrane, let us just look at the properties of the cell membrane. Properties of the cell membrane. Now when you are talking about properties, we are talking about what you possess. So when you are saying these are my properties, I don't know whether there is something like that in English or it is just property, but in biology we have properties. So we are saying properties of cell membrane. I think the English people can correct us on that because property, I think it's just property, but uh, when in science we can uh, just use it for the sake of scientists only. Now, properties of a cell membrane. Property number one, it is that the cell membrane, the cell membrane is semi-permeable. The cell membrane is semi-permeable. When you are talking about anything that is semi, we are talking about half. So when we are saying it is semi-permeable, we are saying it is not fully permeable, meaning it is selectively permeable. It allows some contents to come in and disregards others from coming in. So the cell membrane is semi-permeable, meaning it only allows certain molecules to come inside the cell. So that is property number one. Another property of the cell membrane is uh, its uh, ability to, to sense pH and uh, temperature. So number two, it has high sensitivity, high sensitivity, to pH and temperature. Now, when you are talking about the sensitivity, let us just look at what, what we mean by sensitivity. When you are talking about sensitivity to pH and temperature, we all at this point know that 
the cell membrane has a layer that is a protein layer. And when you look at some of the factors that affect the functioning of proteins is temperature and pH. Why? Because when we have a lot, or let us say, very high temperature, we are saying that the proteins could be denatured. If the temperatures are low, we are saying that the proteins are going now to, to work slowly because we need optimum temperature for the function of, or for the functioning of the protein. Now, assuming that we subject the cell membrane to high uh, temperature, which means that it is going to be disfigured. Now, when it is disfigured, it is not going to properly carry out its function of controlling the movement of molecules inside the cell. So if the cell membrane at its normal looks like this, then you subject it to high temperature or high pH, that is the, you put it in a very high, in acidic uh, solution. Maybe after all that, maybe this is how it will appear. Now when it appears like this, one thing you ought to know is that the pores that we have been talking about, when we, we illustrated, we drew an illustration on the cell membrane, are going to close. So there will be no efficient movement of materials inside and outside this particular cell. So that is how uh, pH affects pH and temperature affects uh, the cell as far as movement of material is concerned. Now, another thing that we ought to look at is uh, the polarization. We are saying that uh, the cell membrane is highly, it is highly polarized. When you are talking about polarization, we are saying that a cell membrane has a net positive charge to the outside and a net negative charge to the inside. So therefore the cell membrane is referred to as polarized. So the charges affect the manner in which substances move into and out of the cell. So that is what we ought to know. Now when you look at the structure of the cell, we have said that uh, the upper structure or within the embedments of the phospholipids we have the protein layers. However, you have to know that uh, the phospholipid layers, that those are the fatty layers of the cell membrane, are hydrophilic, hydrophobic, meaning they do not just allow water to move through. So, because of that, we are saying that the inside, that's what now brings the negative charge within the cell membrane. Having looked at that, let us now narrow down to what we refer to as uh, physiological processes. Physiological processes. So that is the much that a student or a learner needs to know as far as the cell membrane is concerned. First of all, you need to know the structure. You also need to know, you have to draw that structure. You need to know the functions of the cell membrane and uh, also illustrate or tell us anything about the layers of the cell membrane. Now, physiological processes. physiological processes. Now, we want to look at the processes that enable the movement of materials inside and outside the cell. We are saying that those processes, uh, we are saying that this uh, movement or functioning of the cell is aided by specific processes 
there is something behind all this movement. There is something that is enabling the movement of materials inside and outside the cell. So those things that, that thing that is enabling the movement of materials inside and outside the cell is now what we are referring to as physiological processes. Now, physiological processes within the cell are, are three. Number one is diffusion. Number two is what we refer to as osmosis. And the last one is what we term as active transport. Now, these three are the ones that are responsible for the movement of materials inside and outside the cell. So we just want to look at one after the other so that we understand uh, specifically what we are talking about. Now, let's start by the first one, that is diffusion. Diffusion. If you ask what is diffusion, what will you explain? Now, assuming that uh, you are in a class, in a class setup, and someone enters the class, and you notice a change in the smell within the environment, maybe a good perfume within the environment which was not there, how do you relate to that uh, uh, smell reaching your nose? Because someone has just come within, inside the class and changed the whole environment. Now what you are saying is that that particular uh, smell reaches you through this process you are referring to as diffusion. So basically, definition of diffusion is that this is the movement of molecules or particles from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So diffusion definition, we are saying this is the movement, this is the movement of materials partic or particles let us just use particles and molecules so let us say molecules sorry molecules and uh, or particles from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. So we are saying that when I stand before you and I've applied a very strong perfume and you can get the scent from where you are seated, where I am, that is the region of high concentration. The perfume is concentrated on me. So from where I am to where you are, that is the low area of concentration. So you are at a low area of concentration. But now there is a movement of these materials from where I am to where you are. So we are saying that that particular movement of molecules from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration is what we refer to as diffusion. Now, we can just illustrate uh, a, a, a certain examples just to make some uh, good points about uh, diffusion. Let us illustrate here. Just want us to make a better and a clear view of what we are referring to as as far as diffusion is concerned. Now, 
assuming that you you have what we refer to as potassium permanganate permanganate this is just an experiment that uh, is carried out uh, inside our laboratories so this one is a beaker this one full of water this is a beaker full of water this is the water this is one a beaker full of water then we have the second beaker here you introduce let us say you introduce let us put something like this here introduction of potassium permanganate potassium per manganate this is the second beaker second beaker here we want to illust we are uh, illustrating diffusion and specifically diffusion in liquids and on this point let me note that diffusion only occurs in two medium it occurs in gases and and uh, in liquids only diffusion does not occur in solids the reason being uh, uh, the molecules within the solids are highly com uh, compact, uh, compacted and they cannot allow any movement of of this particular molecules of mo of the molecules so we are saying diffusion will only occur in gases and also in in uh, liquids no any other medium so let us continue with our illustration here of course this is a beaker this is the water now we have introduced potassium permanganate which is purple in color Now, after a few minutes, the whole of this water will have changed in color. The whole of this water will have changed in color. I don't know how to put it, but uh, let us assume that now this is the color. So let me put this one like this think blue and red will give me something closer to to purple so the whole of this water would have changed so this is a mixture of water and potassium per manganate purple now so we are saying all this is number 3 all the contents of this beaker will turn into purple so this is an illustration that is normally used when you are talking about the movement of molecules within the liquids when we are il uh, we are illustrating uh, diffusion so you have to talk about potassium permanganate we also have another one we are demonstrating uh, diffusion and uh, specifically diffusion in liquids. We also have another one here. Let's just draw it here. The first beaker, this one here we have what we refer to as this one now this is the starch solution starch solution we are illustrating a uh, diffusion using starch solution and uh, iodine so this is the the other ex example starch solution now this is beaker number one. Beaker one. This is a string, of course. 
then this is what we refer to as let us use the red color to illustrate a different thing this one here now is what we term as the starch solution submerged inside iodine starch solution submerged inside iodine so within now this one is a visking tubing visking tubing so a visking tubing in this perspective is used as a, a representative of a cell membrane the only difference between a visking tubing and a cell membrane is that uh, the cell membrane is found on live uh, organisms while a visking tubing is just a man-made uh, membrane so we are saying within the visking tubing we have starch solution then inside this one inside the beaker here we have iodine solution inside the beaker we have iodine solution now this is at the start of the experiment now at the end of the experiment this is the start of the experiment beaker number two this one here we are saying at the end this is a string as i had illustrated this is just a string so this one the same thing this is a string then now we are looking at the contents within this visking tubing this one here so it will have a mixture of iodine and this which means it is blue black color so inside here we still have our iodine but it is moving now inside the visking tubing this is now iodine moving moving to the visking tubing visking tubing now the change that you may you will note here after the experiment is that the visking tubing would have swollen because iodine now is moving inside this tubing here so we still have our beaker there so we are saying at the end of this experiment maybe you should just make it big so that we make the difference we say that now it would have swollen because the content of iodine has moved into this particular tubing so this is another experiment that is used to examine the movement of uh, molecules and specifically the liquids into into the the liquid iodine into the visking tubing and i've said the visking tubing in this perspective is used as a cell membrane only that cell membrane is found on living things while the visking tubing is manufactured locally so that is what we ought to know of course the other experiment about uh, gases these are in liquids so about gases is what i told you the movement of uh, maybe a perfume from uh, uh, from one person to the rest of you as i've said assuming i'm in class and i come in with a strong perfume and you are able to get that scent when that happens we are saying that there is a process that has facilitated uh, that movement of those particular materials to where you are now for diffusion to to occur we have specific factors that control all these uh, movements of materials there are things that must be put in place for diffusion to occur so that is something that we want to look at in in brief so continue asking your questions uh, through the number that is on your screen and also you can engage us on facebook ku tv now 
Those are the processes, as I've told you. Those are uh, the this one division is one of the physiological process that is involved in the movement of uh, materials, and I've illustrated how it happens in uh, liquids, and I've also talked about how it happens in uh, how it happens in uh, in uh, in gases. So that is what we need to know. Now, let me just look at uh, some of the questions that has been sent here. I'm Yvonne, Step Joy Girls. Now he's asking what is the function of the chloroplast. Now, as I mentioned early, chloroplasts are found in green plants. Mark the word green plants. The major function of the chloroplast within that green plant is to carry out food making process in a process that we refer to as photosynthesis. And we are saying that mostly photosynthesis occurs during daytime because we need sunlight to split the water molecule into hydrogen and oxygen in a process known as photolysis. So specifically, all that process takes place within the leaf of a plant and in the chloroplast. Now, another thing, another question. Hi. Morning teacher, I'm Miriam. Uh, can you elaborate more on the properties, on the properties of, this, of the membrane? Now, as I've said early, is that uh, membranes, and we are talking about uh, the cell membrane for this matter, number one is that uh, it, it is semi-permeable. And I've said that when you are talking about semi-permeability, it is that it allows only small sized molecules to move through to the cell. So any larger molecules cannot pass through the cell. For example, when a cell is surrounded by dilute sugar solution, water molecules may enter the cell, but the sugar molecules, unless they are in a solution form, we are saying they will not enter the cell. So that is something you need to know when you are talking about the movement, the permeability, or the semi-permeability of the membrane. Another one is that uh, what you need to know that uh, semi-permeability can also be referred to as selective permeability, meaning it is selecting what is going into the cell. So that's what you need to know. Another thing we talked about is sensitivity to changes in the temperature and uh, pH. And we say that the cell membrane contains proteins. And I told you that proteins uh, adversely affected by extreme changes in temperature and pH. Now, we are saying that when that happens, there is an alteration of the cell membrane. So this one will hinder the normal functioning of the cell because now it is shape is altered now we are saying that maybe the the pores or the holes on the on the cell membrane are going to do what to to shut so there is no uh, there will be no adequate movement of materials inside and outside the cell another thing we talked about is about uh, a cell membrane being polarized and we are saying that um, uh, the cell membrane has a net positive charge to the outside and a net negative charge to the inside. Therefore, the cell membrane is polarized. So the charges affect the manner in which substances move into and out of the cell. So specifically, those are the three uh, major things that we talked about as far as the properties of a cell membrane is concerned. Now, another, another question is that uh, how do plant cell walls differ from cell membranes? Now, just to, before I answer that question, you have to know that uh, cell walls are only found in plants and not in animals. Now, the difference between the cell wall of a plant 
and the cell membrane is that the cell wall of a plant is permeable to all substances. It is not selective. So any substance can pass through the cell wall of a plant, irregardless of its shape, irregardless of its size. However, a cell membrane, as we have talked about, is a selective membrane. It only allows small sized molecules to pass through. So that is what you ought to know. Nibenson, Nderu, what is the difference between cell wall and a cell membrane? I have illustrated, I have talked about that. Another, another question. Which organelle in an animal cell is referred to as a powerhouse of a cell? Is this the nuclear or the mitochondria? Now I've said that uh, the nuclear, that is the powerhouse of the, of the cell. A mitochondria is just an, a small organelle that carries out only one specific function, that is respiration. But the nuclear has several functions that allow it to be a powerhouse. Now another one is that, uh, thanks Malim, the lesson is active, Fredizo, Nikiwa, Naivasha, okay. Another one is uh, when we say that the cell membrane has highly sensitivity to pH and temperature. Now, okay. Hi, Malim. I'm Masi from Jonjo Girls. Distinguish between tagger pressure and wall pressure. So this one wants to know about tagger pressure and wall pressure. But I've, I've not reached there, but I was coming there. So I don't know whether I should give you... Okay, let us just... Let me just give you before we reach there. Now, we are assuming we have a cell... A plant cell, let me be specific. We are assuming we have a plant cell here. We are assuming we have a plant cell. This is a plant cell here. It is regular, regular in shape. So this is the plant cell, we are just, this is just an assumption. Now, you place this plant cell in a hypotonic solution. That's a solution that has more water. So this plant will be gaining a lot of water. So as it gains a lot, uh, this water, this is a vacuole, cell vacuole. As it is gaining this water, this cell vacuole is pushing against the cell wall. So it is exerting the outward pressure on the cell wall this way. So it is gaining water, this is a vacuole. This is what happening. So there is a pressure that is being exerted outwards towards the cell wall. So this pressure that is being exerted by the cell vacuole against the cell wall, that's what we refer to as the tagger pressure. That is what we refer to as the tagger pressure. Now, however, because the question was uh, uh, tagger pressure and the wall pressure, now, when this cell vacuole is exerting this pressure to the cell wall, there is a resistant force that this cell wall is giving. Now, we are assuming that the vacuole is pushing this one. My palm now is the, is the cell wall. So it is pushing like this there is a resistance force that is coming from the other side to counter the force of the cell vacuole. So this resistant force that is being 
uh, brought by the cell wall to counter the pressure being exerted by the, the, by the cell vacuole is the one that we refer to as the wall pressure. So we are just saying that this, the cell vacuole is pressing against the cell wall and also the cell wall is bringing back the same pressure in equal measures. So when that happens, what we are, we are saying is that now that is what we refer to as the wall pressure. Now another one is uh, to state the difference between the cell wall and the cell membrane. That one I have talked about. Uh, another one is that um, in an exam setup, how can one differentiate osmosis and division when the diagram is drawn? Now, I don't know specifically which diagram you are talking about, but what I want to tell you is this. In an exam situation, when the diagram is drawn, maybe for example the diagram that I've drawn at the end of, the, of this board, and you are not able to realize what you need to do at this particular region, now you have to look at the content of the beaker. In an exam situation, try to look at the content of the beaker. Now, when you are defining osmosis, because you have not reached there, but now because of my learner, when you are defining osmosis, you will realize that osmosis is just the movement of water molecules from a region where they are highly concentrated to a region where the same same molecules are lowly concentrated across a semi-permeable membrane. So in an exam situation, look at where we have a lot of water. Now, for, for instance, if we drew this particular thing here, and we introduced, let me introduce, let me introduce a, a visking tubing here, then I place starch in this let me put their starch or uh, sodium chloride or whatever. I place starch here in this tubing here. This is now starch. Now we are talking about exam situation. You will realize this one is a visking tubing which is acting as a, this is a visking tubing. We are just illustrating osmosis now because somebody is asking about the exam situation. Now, for you to identify the process that is being in, uh, asked in this question, you look at the content that is within this beaker. We have starch, we have water. So you know that osmosis is the movement of water molecules from the region where they are highly concentrated. So water will be moving from this beaker to, to this visking tubing. Now, you also look at, uh, after what has happened here, you look at the content in the beaker. Ha have they reduced? Assuming you are in an exam situation, have they reduced? Maybe now, this was the level of water. Then at the end, the level of water reduces to somewhere around here. This means that some water have moved to, to, the, to the visking tubing. So those are things that you look at while you are in a, an exam. Has the content reduced, meaning the water has moved? Has, uh, do you have starch and you have water? Water is moving from the region where it is highly concentrated to a region where it is lowly concentrated. And it is lowly concentrated in the visking tubing. So those are the things that you just need to look at when you are inside an exam situation. Now, another question is from uh, Benson Deru. That is uh, the difference between the cell wall. I've explained that. Another one is uh, when we say the cell membrane has highly, that one I've explained. Uh, um, Amasi from Jonjo. Tiger pressure I've explained. Most of the questions are repeated here. Uh, what is a cell? That one I explained at the beginning, but just to repeat, we say that a cell is a basic functional unit 
of any living organism. Another question is uh, what is semi permeable? I'm Yvonne from that one I've answered you. Now, can you, uh, morning teacher Miriam, can you elaborate that? So, most of the questions here I've answered them. So, let us just co uh, continue so that we wind. We wind up with what you are looking at. Most of the questions that have been sent here, I've just answered them right away. There's no question left. Now, we have said that uh, for diffusion to occur, there must be certain things that come in place to allow it to occur. Now, for that matter, we just want to look at... Uh, Factors that affect diffusion. In brief, factors that affect diffusion. We are just looking at them in a brief way. Number one is temperature. Temperature. Now, at low temperature, particles move very slowly. That is because there is uh, a slow charge or uh, the kinetic uh, motion of the particles is reduced. So when the temperatures are low, we are saying particles will move very slowly. Now as temperatures rises, they gain more energy and so they move faster. So an increase in temperature causes an increased rate of diffusion. So that is one thing you ought to know. Now, the other thing is uh, the surface area. Surface area. Another thing is the surface area. So, when surface area is large, more of the substances diffuses across than when it is small. As long as the concentration and temperature of the diffusion molecule, of the diffusing molecules, remain the same. Now, another thing is the concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. When you are talking about concentration gradient, we are saying that a greater difference in concentration of particles between two regions results in a steeper concentration gradient and vice versa. So, to illustrate concentration gradient in simple diagrammatic representation is that uh, you have a barrier here and you have so many concentrated molecules here. Let us just say maybe for illustration, let us just say these are water molecules because of time. So these are barrier, these are concentration gradient. We have lesser molecules in this region. So more of these molecules here, because they are highly concentrated in this region, this is region A and this is region B, more of these molecules will be moving towards this side. Because we have fewer on region B and more on region A. So most of them will be moving from A to B. So that is now what brings about the difference in concentration gradient. We are also talking about the distance that the particle moves. Another thing that brings about diffusion is the difference, the distance as we wind up distance of travel in the distance of travel in molecules so when the distance is small we are saying that uh, the the molecules are going to move uh, very fast and in an orderly way now let's just wind up from there but what i want to tell you is that uh, when we are talking about diffusion, you should know that uh, diffusion is a multi-directional process, meaning that it can occur in all directions. Suppose I'm standing here, the, the molecules can move either before me or after me or uh, on the side. So that is what you ought to know. So as we continue, let us continue to follow the government regulations on uh, combating this pandemic and let us also behave outside there 
let us not engage in the activities that are going to lead us to where we were not meant to be. Our ladies, please stay safe and avoid uh, these teenage pregnancies. Thank you. Until we meet again.